and welcome to The People's Story. My name is Charlotte and I'm from the Soul Archive. And today my very special guest is the man, the myth and the legend, Keb Darj. Welcome Keb Darj, how are you doing? That's me, I'm a very special guest. Ooh, lying <laughs> in my bed, as you can see with the pillows behind me. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's nice. It's nice to know I'm in bed with Keb Darj. Um, <laughs> um, Okie dokie. So how are you doing? Are you okay? I bored shitless and penniless, but uh, aye, all right. Yeah. My only income was DJing, you see, for the last 30 years, so that's it, but I'm all right. It must be much like a struggle for you during lockdown, especially, if, you know, you're quite a sociable guy, aren't you? So you I'm a sociable out. guy. I do get bored shitless if I don't get out and play my records and talk shit to people. <laughs> yeah. So have you been keeping busy during lockdown? <laughs> Same as everyone, Netflix and all that nonsense. <laughs> I know, I've been actually, I spent about six or seven hours a day scouring for records. I'm still a record buying fanatic. So I just wanted to start off with your background story. So like, tell me where you're from. I want to know Keb Darge before he found music and soul music. So just a little bit of uh, introduction of your life growing up a little bit. All right, then it all started with Judith McVean, my first love. We were going to run away together because we were in love, but the parents didn't understand. And then we thought, come on then. I went and knocked on her window and she came running out and took out a tin cup. And we both peed in the tin cup and then hid it in a stone dyke wall behind her. Her dad was a vet and waited for the babies to develop and all that. And then we went off to play on some whiskey barrels in Craigellachie and forgot all about the, the babies because we were starting school the next week. We were both six or seven years old and all that. And that was my start of life, my first love. <laughs> we never had the babies, so the, the cup's um, probably still there. <laughs> well, <laughs> so whereabouts is that? So it must be Scotland. Craig Gellachie. It's oh. up uh, River Spey, the Space River, up in the highlands of Scotland. Aye. Right. And now... land, where men shag sheep and things like that. <laughs> You're not one of them. Um... Uh, how do you know? <laughs> oh. Um, Okie doke. So, um, so after <laughs> after your first love and pissing in cups. Um, right. uh, so, like, what were your hobbies like? How what was life growing up? How you know what did you get up to before you found music? All right, as a wee boy, toy soldiers and reading history books. As a teenager, I was a bit of a thug, and I got put into hospital. Well, I picked a fight with about 24 blokes, so obviously I got put in hospital. When I came out, I picked on the one English boy at school, because that's what you do when you're trying to reassert yourself, and everyone picked on the poor English fucker. And, all that. and he span round and hit me in the ribs with a sidekick. Then as I was falling down, he hit me on the shoulder with an axe kick. I thought, fuck me, Davy, what the fuck was that? It's like, Taekwondo, what's that? I go to the RAF base. Uh, do you want to come? Aye, I do. So I got into Taekwondo, and it was like, that was my life. Taekwondo was everything. Scottish champion twice. Did all right oh, with was you really? And when, and when was that? When was you? When was 1975, 76. So how old was you then? Got to work that out, 18. No, 75, I was 18, yeah. So what, what made you so passionate about the Taekwondo? Like what was initially, I wanted, <laughs> initially, I wanted to go back to school and kick fuck out of the boys that had put me in hospital. But as I did the taekwondo more i became more and more peaceful and thought ah, there's no fucking point you know i'm enjoying this this is fun so the aggression was got out of me sparring and shit like that and i became a peaceful cool hippie type so how did you get into soul music like what was your first ever experience my first ever experience was before that but i wasn't into it, it I was maybe 11 or 12 and my sister was a mod and she was playing me all the Motown Stacks Atlantic stuff and all that and I liked it and then she became a hippie and was playing the purple exploding plastic bubble machine shit and taking drugs I didn't like it and she gave me her records but I wasn't a, you know I just I liked them I wasn't enthused by it I said that's nice that's better than the shit that, that she's playing now but I wasn't interested it wasn't until it was a taekwondo Christmas party it would have been 74, Christmas 74 or something. And I was at the RAF base because the Taekwondo, most of it was at a local RAF base, RAF Lossy Mouth and all that. And we goes in and we were looking at Harry's, which is the expression for young women and all that, thinking, oh, you fucking hell, well, she's all right, she's all right. <laughs> and I sat with a guy, Mick Smith, who's now Grandmaster Mick Smith from Newcastle and all that. And they were playing all the shite of the day. Uh, what would it be? I was going to say David Bowie, but I quite like him. Um, 
Uh, Gary Glitter, all that kind of stuff was getting played. And then I saw three boys walk up to the decks where we handful of records. I thought, what the fuck are they doing? And Vic Flett was the local DJ, and they handed the records to Vic Flett and started chatting to him. Uh, all right, fair enough. Then just ignored it. Then the music changed, and on came this sort of strings. <laughs> and these guys started spinning and dancing and doing flips. I was like, what the fuck is that? Jesus Christ, Mickey, what's that? It's called Northern Soul. Fucking hell, I want some of that. If I can do that, I'll get a shag. No bother. I was a virgin at the time. <laughs> and I thought, fuck me, I'm going to learn to dance like that. So Pete was one of the guys. Fuck me, what was his surname? Can't remember. Anyway, I introduced myself to them, started yapping away, and they told me about a night in Dundee coming up in a month's time. And I thought, right, I'm going to Dundee. I'm going to get into this stuff. That's it. And then from then on, I was like, I wanted to get this dancing done, which I found quite easy because the Taekwondo had taught me balance and centering so I could spin quite easily and I would stretch the fuck. I was doing box splits and all that, so I could do fancy tricks. It took me longer to get the basic step than it did to do the spins and the fancy tricks because of the Taekwondo, but that was it. So, that, so it was completely by chance that you experienced Northern Soul. Um, ah. Which, yeah. is, which is quite fascinating. Are you still friends with the, the guys who you first Mickey met? Thompson, I am, yeah. Mickey Thompson, he's an eighth Dan Taekwondo grandmaster. He's stuck at the Taekwondo and I got into the Northern and Taekwondo sidetracked. I was still at it for about five or six years and all that, but sidetracked and Northern took over. Because it was, I went there, so I'm from the north of Scotland. I was going to local discos and you'd sort of sit and walk around looking at the girls and dance with a girl. Then the fight would happen. Then you might get thrown out, you might not, and then you'd carry on dancing. Then I goes to Dundee, and then everyone's dancing, spinning a block. Well, you've been to Northern Soul events, haven't you? But back then it was a bit more wild, and there was a lot more, the dancing was a lot more important. And there were fanaticals spinning like bastards, again. wonderful stuff. And I was like, fuck me, what a difference. This is the world I want. So that was me hooked. So how old was you then when you um, when you got into the music then, like? 18. I was quite old for compared to most of the folk. Aye. Well, when I was born in 57, so uh, 77, <laughs> I was 20, 75, I was, yeah, 18. What was the first record that did it for you? Like, how, what was it fuck like, that, this is my music now? Fucked if I know. The first record I went up and asked, what the fuck is that, was the human beings, nobody but me. Do, 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 do. When that came on, like, at the start of it, this was at Dundee, I was like, fuck me, this is different. This is, what the fuck is this? So I went up to the DJ and says, what is this? And I remember that clear as day. I remember getting excited and then chasing one and I got one. And I was very excited. But there was the records before that that I was like, ooh, 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 but I was too shy to go and ask the DJ. I hadn't taken any gear by then, you see. And I didn't really take gear much at all. So Dundee was your like your first influence of soul music. First proper all nighter, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, club, sorry. How did you get into the more nitty gritty of the all nighter scene in in the seventies, going into the eighties? Like what uh, what venues did you go to next? Uh, folk just told me about Wigan, 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 and all that. So I hitched down to Wigan. Actually, I. Was, I had three girlfriends at the time. Here's a funny story. Three girlfriends at the time, one in Aberdeen, one in Nottingham who's come to holiday in Aberdeen once who was in the Northern, uh, in Elgin, sorry, not Aberdeen, and a girl from London because I'd visited my sister in London. And I was in the Scottish Taekwondo Finals Championships and I invited them all individually, not expecting any of them to turn up. All oh, fucking three of them did turn up. <laughs> and, and I had to pretend I was injured so I could sneak out. Anyway, I'll jump to it. The girl from Nottingham invited me down to, she just lived outside Darfield, just outside Nottingham, just outside Nottingham. She says, Kev, come down, I'll take you across to Wigan, meet with the fucking Nottingham crowd and all that. I thought, I ain't bother. All right then. So I hitched down to Nottingham, spent the Friday night with her then across to Wigan on the Saturday on the double deck of orange buses and all that, full of troops, full of Northern Soul people. It was like, ooh, fucking hell, there's loads of them. It was very exciting. And then walked into Wigan and that was it. Love at first sight. Like, that's me. And, uh, it took me about a year before I moved down there. I've got a job down there. I used to hitch all the time from Elgin. Then I moved to Aberdeen to go to university. Then I started getting people in Aberdeen into Northern. Nobody was into Northern in Aberdeen when I first went there. I used to go to the local discos and hand records to the DJ to play and have a wee dance myself. Then blokes around me said, what the fuck's that? Where'd you learn to do like that? If I can dance like that, I'm about to get a shag too. Show us, teach us, what is it? <laughs> and that's how I was taking troops down. 
And I convinced a couple of guys. One was a David Bowie fan. One was a Rod Stewart fan at the time. Speedy, who I still see quite regularly. He lives in London. And Irvy, Irvy Milne, who's in Aberdeen, runs the Soul Clubs in Aberdeen. I convinced them to to take a car out to Wigan and all that. So we goes down for the... On, arrived on the Friday night and all that. We slept in a police cell. We convinced the police to let us sleep in the cell. Then on the Saturday day time, I went to Ross and Stanley. Used to have a stall at the market then. Yeah. And I went up. I says, uh, Ross, uh, do you know any jobs going down here? He says, Aye. Uh, my mate runs the Grand Hotel around the corner. He's looking for a barman. Live in. I'm like, right, that's mate. Fine, I'll do it. So I moved to Wigan. That was late '75 or '76 or something like that. I moved to Wigan. And then that was me every week and Wednesday nights going to Ainsdale, Tiffs and places like that. Just three or four nights a week out to Northern Dews. Why, why were you so passionate about Northern Soul during that time for, for you to actually move to like the, the centre of Northern Soul, which was Wigan at the time? So what, that life what was, was fucking th- shite otherwise. It was boring. You know, it really was dull. You go to a woolly disco then and it was just a woolly disco that was... Uh, you know, as Dave Withers said on the interview, it just wasn't a pleasurable thing. They were there for a shag or a fight, you know, especially up where I come from. It was fighting and shagging, that was it. And nobody was getting enthused. It was just so fucking exciting, really. The northern scene then was super exciting, electric, and you know, I was like, yes, I want this. I want excitement in my life. I suppose that's maybe why I got into the title and doing stuff like that. I like excitement. Yeah, so it's all about the adrenaline and everything. So when you were working as a barman, where was you living in Wigan? In the hotel. So I was living in the Grand Hotel. It was on Dorning Street. It was the Grand Hotel. I think it's knocked down now. Uh, I I used to run a night in Wigan. The Grand Hotel had a wee disco built on, so I used to run a pre-all-nighter night there. And one night we got a coach load for Aberdeen turns up. They're all traipsing into the club. Okay, if anywhere we can get a fucking shower and all that. We've been on the bus for 12 hours. I'm like, I need bother. Uh, my room's number 57. Just go in, knock the door. It's got a loose lock on it. You won't need to fucking bother and all that. And you go. So off the old trapes and all that. Disappear. Half an hour later, the manager came. Okay, what the fuck's going on? What? Mr. and Mrs. Simpson have just returned to the room at number 67 and all that, and there's some bloke in their bathtub, there's three blokes sleeping on their bed, and a couple of girls putting makeup on. I'm like, oh, fuck, wrong room. Sorry, boys. I know that. I just remembered that just now. Uh, so these <laughs> How did troops, you not lose your job? <laughs> I didn't. No, I was good at my job and all that. So I'd, uh, here you go, here's more stories. We had, uh, fuck, Archie Bell was playing at the casino and all that, and they were staying at the Grand Hotel with the band but the band were all English they used to be in chairman on the board some of them and all that I was sitting chatting to them because they were southerners they got into a fight in the bar you know that with the locals bloody southern bastards and all that Ken. so I leapt over the bar did a bit of the kung fu business and all that saved the day get, got taken to the Manchester Brits on the coach world she bell and all that and the Grand Hotel boss, who should have sacked me, thought, this guy's really handy, let's keep him, he can do the barman and the security. So I think that's why he kept me. Tell me more about Wigan. So um, so for maybe some of the younger audience and stuff, just describe the venue, describe the DJs, and just tell me a little bit more. One of the DJs was big and fat with curly hair. Another one was skinny with a slightly bald patch. Another one had a club foot and, and sadly he's just died. Uh, the venue, they've seen the venue. It's a huge fucking venue. Um, it was just the excitement. Um, every fuck, I, didn't, I only took speed for a wee whiley. You know, there was the Dundee boys, God, Gabe, you need some gear and all that. I took it for a while, but my cock was shriveling up and all that. I thought, no, fuck that. I'm not going to bother with the speed. Except that I just, and I was a fit cunt because of the tight window, so I could dance all night without any speed and all that. But everyone else was, and they were all, ah, and the sound system was booming, and it was exciting records. Virtually all the time was exciting records. There wasn't many super soulful records. Like today, I listen to some of the stuff they're raving about, and it's like, yeah, it's nice and soulful, but it's not exciting. And I like the excitement. I loved when I first heard Burning Bush come out. Ginger played Burning Bush for the first time at the casino. And I was like, whoa, yeah, fuck it. It was huge. It ex- exploded. And as I was exploding inside, so was another seven or 800 people on the dance floor were boom, fucking hell, listen to this. Oh, and going wild. And that was that complete release. 
I'm not a psychiatrist, but uh, you know, I can <laughs> no, to I release to myself. I, I totally hear where you're coming from, hearing a record right. for the first time on the decks, especially when it's quite an atmospheric venue. And, and I suppose as young people, we have a, a very small fraction of what you actually experienced in, in, in its aye. day. Aye, that's the, that would be the difference for you, unfortunately, was, as I said, when I was experiencing it for the first time, everyone else was experiencing it for the first time. So it was hugely exciting. Now you'll go to a venue and there'll be... 15 or 20 of you youngsters thinking, fucking hell, what's this? And then the old crowd thinking, oh, yes, this one again. So you're not getting the same buzz I got as everyone heard it. And everyone's like, fuck, 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 fuck. What was your most favourite memory of, of your time, experience the Wigan All Night? Is I think Burning Bush was my most exciting. Wow, fuck me, this is the record for me. I love this record. Jesus Christ, what a marvellous thing. That was very exciting hearing that for the first time. Uh, if it was what was my favourite, it would be all the crowd I used to go with. You know, it was all, I was with the Scottish crowd. I didn't know many English folk at Wigan, and they were all wild fuckers. There wasn't any refined people used to go. They were all savages. Unfortunately, most of them are dead now because they were all savages and because they took a wee bit too much gear. But my favourite memory would be the people. So, yeah, so during the times of Wigan, is that when your DJ career started? Because uh, obviously, you're hosting your own venue. Well, just before Wigan, uh, we started a club in Aberdeen called the Centre City Soul Club, and it was Jonathan Scott playing the new release disco stuff, and me playing Northern, but I'd keep back some Northern for him to play so I could have a dance to etc. And that, that, I mind them, um, I was doing the Mecca. I was buying bootlegs and cheap records and all that. Then I was at the Blackpool Mecca one night, and they just played Ron Holden, I'll forgive and forget, at Wigan a couple of weeks before as a new year and all that. And here was it sitting in a box for seven quid, which was a week's wages at the time. And I thought, oh, fucking hell, fucking hell. Well, what if my mum found out I spent seven quid on a fucking record? Oh, Christ, no. And then some guy went to grab it, so I fucking grabbed it. When I got to Aberdeen and played it, and the heads of the crowd turned, oh, fucking hell, Keb's got that in and all that. Then a week later, there was folk arrived from Dundee and Edinburgh to hear Keb DJing on the Sunday night. Kev Dodge has got Ron Holden, Kev Dodge has got Ron Holden. I thought, oh, fuck, I like this. Right, I'm going to get big records now, you cunt. So I started chasing big records because of the ego thing. Purely ego. Nothing to do with, I want to share the music with the people. It was all about, yeah, look at me, you cunts, look what I've got. That plays a lot in today's soul scene as well. It's Aye. all about those big, big money records. Um, Aye. So they were more expensive because there weren't many copies in Britain at the time. So you were paying a bit, you know, records that are cheap today were big money then because there was only a few copies in Britain. So you were paying for the exclusivity of paying something that hadn't been played to death before. And now I see folk paying seven grand for the record that's been paid 76,000 times on the scene. I'm like, what the fuck are you paying out money for that for? You can get a decent bootleg of it or whatever. Why go wild on a record that's been played to death 30 years ago. You know, I would pay money happily, like Butch does, for stuff that this hasn't been played at all. Yes, I'll pay money for it, but I'm not going to pay a fortune. I can't understand this paying a fortune for records that have been hammered to death. That's a bit... So mine was ego. That's sort of fake ego, or there's something wrong with that in my working. I'd much rather listen to a spot of... of stuff I've never heard of before and be educated rather than, you know, listen to stuff that I can listen to uh, whenever not, I want. I wouldn't even say it's just the educated thing, it's the excited. I get excited about hearing someone I don't know. You know whether I'm being edu well, I'm being educated at the same time, but the thrill of it is being excited about hearing something you don't know, which was the whole thing of Wigan. That's why we travelled so far, you know? Sometimes it took me two days to fucking get there because I used to hitch for Elgin. It would take me 12 hours one day just to get to Aberdeen, getting on lifts like, where are you going, Wigan? Where's that, son? Down by Manchester. Oh, Christ, I'm going to the Ochtermachty farm. It's just three miles down the road. Will that do you? I jump in the back. And that, so it took us ages to get there. I wouldn't have done that if I was hearing classics. You know? I never got into the oldies all nighters when they started them on the Fridays. I said, what are you doing that? I can hear that in Dundee. I can hear that in Edinburgh. I'm going to Wigan to hear the stuff I can't hear elsewhere. So follow Butch if you want that today. He's one of the, well, he's the top boy for turning up good new tunes. He was doing that for the Stafford era when, um, when Northern Soul was pretty much 
you know, dying out a little bit. And, and you know, oh, during its darkest days. You... It's darkest days. <laughs> well, it become... So there was the two splits of the scene. There was the jazz funk disco thing, which Levine and all that kicked off at the makeup, and it took away sort of half the members of the sort of northern soul scene. And it was just brand new release disco and all that were playing at the makeup, and the jazz funk scene kicked off, and we had fights and shit like that, and that split the scene a bit. I actually enjoyed the jazz funk and disco. I went to their clubs, I went to the makeup all deals and all that. But I love me sixties northern. That was a split. And the thing they used to slag off in the arguments in Black Echoes and personal arguments was that the Northern scene wasn't soul, it was just pop and a bit of soul and all that, and jazz funk was real soul. So that hit home. Um, and folks that are demanding more soul on the Northern nights to try and compensate this, but they weren't getting it, they were getting pop from when Stanley, blah, 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 blah. Then you had the modern soul scene kicked off when Sam played uh, Oh Happy Day at the, what was it, the Carousel Ballroom in Manchester. He played it for the first time, covered up, Flaming King. And all that. I remember that, and I remember looking at the speed and saying, fucking hell, this is like disco, but it's a bit more lush. Oh, fuck, I like this, I like this modern stuff. And that split it again. The modern crowd, Sam was slagging off the, the 60s Newies stuff, he turned his back on 60s Newies, though he used to play a lot of pop himself, he'll deny it now, and all that. And then the scene became a, a modern scene for those that wanted soul, and oldies for those that wanted stompers. And virtually nobody was playing 60s Newies. Salem would play some, and then a load of modern stuff. Gary Rush would play some mixed in with oldies and all that, but virtually no one was pushing 60s Newies anymore. You know, and they were playing the same record for two or three years, and it wasn't a turnover like it used to be. And there was a guy, oh, I can't remember his name, Kevin someone, used to run an all-nighter at Peterborough, and he thought, I'm going to put on a 60s news all-nighter, and all that, and I was advertised in Echo, so I thought, oh, fucking hell, that looks interesting, right, I'm going to go to that. By this time, I'd moved to London. I moved to London in 1979, so uh, I thought, I'll go to this Peterborough all-nighter, it's all 60s news. I think about 27 people turned up. I'm exaggerating, maybe 57 and that. But it was Gary Rushbrook, Kev Draper, Guy Hennigan, Dave Withers, and I can't mind who else. But anyway, first time I'd heard Dave Withers play, I was like, fucking hell, oh, fucking everything, perfect, all brand new discoveries. And all that. then Guy Hennigan, fucking hell, everything, perfect, all brand new discoveries. Then Kev Draper, oh, fucking hell, loads of new discoveries. And he had the second copy of uh, Cecil Washington, which was, you know, that was the second copy it turned up. No one else had it apart from Sierland then. I was, oh, fucking hell, this is a, a brilliant night. And I went and sat in the record bar, and then I started yapping to this guy, Hennigan chap, who I'd never met before. And that, and he was like, yeah, I'm discussing the scene and how it was going down the hill with just all these and modern and all that. He says, right, we have to save it and all that. You're de I, by this time, I was DJing in the London area. And all that. I did nights with Mick Smith at the West Hampstead Country Club. Then I did the 100 Club and all that. And I was like, Wait, let's team up. You know, I've seen you at the 100 Club. Stop playing modern. Just play 60s Newies, because I was playing modern at the time as well. Get an attitude, thump an attitude into the crowd. I'll do the same, blah, 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 blah. This is what we have to do. This was a plan me and Guy hatched at this Peterborough all night. So we have to get the scene back into getting excited about 60s Newies. So he, he laid down the law to me and I thought yeah that makes sense I'm going to do that all right I'll stop playing modern I'll just hammer six station ways and I'll get on the microphone and be vociferous and slag folk off and accept that and I was rather vociferous and um, it started to gather interest I think Guy will say and I'll agree because our personalities were quite strong you know what I mean there was other folk doing it Dave Withers got booked at Stafford before us and he was playing a tremendous set five people dancing, you know, when the, the suspicion was first played, there was five people dancing. Uh, um, Love Starved Heart, Marvin Gaye, when it first got played, five people dancing. No one was interested. I love Dave, but he didn't have a forceful character and all that. So me and Guy being forceful characters, plus the fact, this is true, uh, Keith Mansell and Dave Withers came down to see me DJing at an old day in Reading because... Um, Sorry, Keith Minchell and Dave Thorley came down to see me DJing and reading because Dave Withers had packed in. He was like, fuck it, what's the point? No cunts interested at all that. And he sold his records to me and Guy. 
they came down to see if I was a suitable replacement. At the time, I had this gorgeous girlfriend called Michelle, who Dave thoroughly couldn't keep his fucking eyes off all the time, and I got the booking simply because he fancied Michelle. No, the records were good, and I was okay on the microphone and all that, but I reckon, guaranteed, you can ask him, Dave thoroughly booked me to do Stafford because of Michelle. He wanted to see her there every fortnight and all that, so that's how I got that booking. And then I got on the microphone, did my thing, and it worked. Again, it took time, though. Uh, was it um, So In Love, Tony Gala? I think I played that for about three months before anyone danced. Nobody was dancing to it, because it wasn't an oldie and it wasn't a modern. But I would shout and swear at them, and eventually a crowd gathered up. And then I convinced Dave Thordley to book Guy as well. And that, so Guy joined the lineup. So the Stafford event, could you just explain them a little bit? Venue at Stafford was more plush than the all-nighters before, than the casino or the Dundee Marriott Hall. It was like a rich uh, Mecca-style disco with nice booths to sit in, and they went up at levels looking down on the dance floor. And a decent-sized dance floor, you'll fit about 800 or 1,000 on the dance floor. Uh, big stage. Uh, when I first started going, it was um, I went as a punter, it was a mixture of modern soul, which by this time, this is 1982, had become brand new release, 12 inch drivel like Booker Newbury down to Love Town and that. And this is what Richard Seelan and Dave thought they were playing a few 60s, new A's, and then mostly old A's and modern. And it was all right, but it wasn't exciting and it wasn't that busy, etc. Now, um, Dave Withers was playing a magnificent set of 60s newies there at the very start. Dave Thornley put him on for the first hour when there was virtually nobody there. And, uh, and we used to flood in and he got the unreleased smoke out and he got Love Starve, Heart, Suspicion, stuff like that was getting played for the first time, but only five folk on the dance floor. And uh, It was exciting for us, but there was no atmosphere because folk were just coming in. And then once Dave Withers finished his 60s newest set on came the 12 inch disco drivel and all that. And to me, it killed the atmosphere that could have been. So, and Guy and me were sitting there grumbling all the time, like fucking idiots. Why don't they put 60s newest on? Fucking idiots, fucking idiots, etc. Anyway, Dave Withers packed in. He got fed up. He said, What the fuck's the point? I'm playing to you and Guy and a few other people, Pete Lawson and all that. Uh, bollocks, I'm packing in do you want my records? So Dave Withers packed in and sold me and Guy all his records. Well, sold the ones we wanted and not as he sold to other people, but all the new is me and Guy jumped in and bought what we fucking could and all that. And that was it. And then um, the, by this time, there was a bit of a 60s new age movement and it was thugs. It was Pete Lawson, uh, Tomo, like hooligan types and all that. And they threatened to, I can't even mind, I believe they threatened to burn down Stafford if they didn't replace Withers with a 60s, true, a 60s new age DJ and all that. So I was DJ in, in Reading at an all day and Keith Mintzel and Dave Thornley came down to see if I was suitable as a replacement because they'd heard I was playing a lot of 60s news, suitable as a replacement for Withers and all that. And then, like I say, I believe thoroughly that because Dave Thornley saw my girlfriend at the time, who was a very beautiful girl called Michelle, and thought, fuck, and hell, I want to see her at the club every time. Hey, let's book this Keb Dodge. Whereas Keith Minsell thought, yeah, Keb's records are good, fucking hell, let's book him, and he's good on the microphone, he can DJ, let's have him in. So I got the booking at Stafford. And yeah, I think they started me off again at the start of the night. I was getting the first set when people were just arriving. And as I say, I played things like Tony Gala for two or three months before it got any response. But I was very vociferous on the microphone and I was slagging off and stuff like that, which created an attitude in a few of the people that started slagging off. And then they started moaning to Thordley and the promoters saying, fucking hell, what are you putting Kev on at the start for? For fuck's sake, so he's playing, you know, the best set of the night. <laughs> And I, so I got moved to a better set, and then I kept on creating this atmosphere of fucking shite, let's get more 60s news on, and then convinced them to book uh, Guy Hennigan as well. And eventually got Jim Wenziora, and they gave Butch, I mind fucking, this was ridiculous, Butch had the records then that he's got, well, had some of the records then he's got now, and I was trying to convince them, put Butch on for fuck's sakes, and I was told he hasn't served his time. 
you know, we'll give him a spot in the upstairs room. I'm like, have you listened to the records you've got, you fuckers? And there was the old guard protecting the old guard, you know. We don't want these new boys coming in. And, all that. and I remember that. Now, Dave Thornley, you can argue the toss about that, but I remember that clear as day. And the same with Jim Wenziora. They didn't want Jim Wenziora, who had a killing set of records, or Butch on, I believe, because it was a threat. There you go. There's honesty. Dave Thornley's going to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, yeah. So you've heard it from the horse's mouth right now, Dave yeah. Foley. Uh, but yeah, this, this Stafford All Night, it just seems like everything that the Northern Soul scene needs right now, actually. And um, right. it, I like just hearing your your version of, of the events, like, it just sounds so ex- exciting, especially that like the types of DJs that were on and the, 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 the misfits that you were hanging around with. Like, um, misfits were good, yes. Yeah. Misfits made it an exciting night. Could, could you could you tell me a little bit more about some of the misfits that you were hanging about with, like like Pete Lawson and all of that? I'd, I'd love to know more. <laughs> uh, maybe some of the adventures that you went on or some of the antics that happened. So, well, Pete was a character, you know. I'd be so I'd sit in the record bar beside Pete at this time. This was the eighties and all that. I'd be sitting at the record bar beside Pete, and because I was getting a name for myself as a DJ, I'd get arse lickers coming up and talking to me about, oh, "Can you play this record on a red label and blah 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 blah." If Pete recognised that I was like being polite and all that he would reach under the table with his lighter and set fire to the guy's shirt and he did this quite a few times okay? so there'd be the guy going okay oh, amazing blah blah blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and bugger off so that was Pete's way of getting rid of um, ear nippers who just wanted to impress that they knew about records and all that shit uh, I don't know the wild times f- fun things right Wigan uh, Aberdeen coach, we got a coach down and all that, which involved Donny Shaughnessy's piles and the usual carry on. The drug squad came on and we'd put all the gear into sandwiches and stamped on the floor to hide it in the sandwiches. Then the folk would pick the sandwiches off the floor of the bus and eat them later or that because they weren't going to waste good gear. Apart from me, I didn't touch this stuff. But I, I've got, I just had a memory when you said it of a funny one that I enjoyed tremendously. We finished the all-nighter, we went to the swinging baths, in the morning, I didn't have any swimming trunks. So anyone got any boxing shorts that like swimming trunks? So Speedy says, here you go, Keb. Hands me his shorts. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, Speedy, there's big skid marks in them. And then Gordon Wallace, who was the fucking, he's now another eighth Dan Taekwondo champ and all that, pulled them up thinking, hey, look at Dargy's pants, look at Dargy's pants, and runs around showing everyone the skid marks, thinking they were mine. I thought, right, you can't, I'll have you. And that, so they go into the pool. I sees Gordon Wallace across the pool from me and I dives in under the water, swims under stealthily, grabs his legs, pulls him down, pulls his fucking pants down, sticks my finger nail up his arse and scrapes the inside of his arse and then pushes his head under the water. As I do this, I see Gordon Wallace and all the Aberdeen troops pissing themselves laughing on the side of the pool and a couple of kids screaming, Daddy, 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 please. <laughs> so I lifts this guy up on my oh, fuck, I'm sorry, I thought it was my pal, you know, and, uh, and uh, so I'd pulled this poor cunt down thinking it was Wallace, and he'd got the scrape of my fingernail through the, the tube of his arse, there you go. Th- this was the, cu- this went on every week, that was uh, fun stuff. Right? <laughs> that is so, hilarious, that is so yeah. funny. So, uh, um, just going back to, you was talking about the, um, the titles and stuff, You've actually held quite a few titles, so you, you, you've obviously done the Taekwondo, and then now uh, you was also the had the award for being the best Northern Soul DJ or the title for the best Northern Soul. Oh, uh, that was in Black Beat magazine. Aye, that was about eighty four or something like that. Yeah, they they took votes. <laughs> I was so happy to be above guy. We've been at war ever since. <laughs> yeah, there's um, we've actually got it on the Soul Archive website. Um, uh-huh. um, a sound clip. I think um, uh, trickster Chris Harvey. He donate he uh, donated this this sound clip of both you and Keb back to back on the DJ decks at Stafford, and right. you can hear the rivalry in the, right. um, in the sound which is really good so you'll have to go click on yeah. that and uh, listen to that back rivalry was good that forced us so that was what made it exciting was the turnover of tunes and every week we'd have to turn up with someone to beat that cunt you know what i mean and he'd turn up with someone to beat me and it, the crowd benefited because we were fighting to get the best tunes you know and new tunes new tunes new tunes new tunes fuck i played that for three weeks finished next and all that yeah why why did records have such like a short 
like shelf life. If, we were know, still trying to prove a point. We're still there were still so many folk in the oldies and all that, and we were still saying, so "You fucking wankers, come on! There's so many records that you've missed out on here. Grab them and all that." One drawback, uh, which is my fault, I was having a constant battle with Soul Sam and Black Echoes at the time. He was slagging it off, saying it was all white pop and all that business, and then the. I think they dragged him in. They dragged Sam in. Anyway, I wound up one night, Tomo and that crowd in the press, and Simon tapped me on the shoulder, and they tied Sam to a chair behind me. I thought, right, I'm going to play a really soulful set. So I started playing beat ballads and things, and really soulful things, just to sort of say to Sam, you can't, it's all soulful. Normally, I was I was playing enchantments and garagey things and all northern, but this one night, I thought I'll play all this deep, solely sounding stuff to stop Sam slagging me off. I know that, and he did. He was like, oh, fucking hell, I didn't realise that much. So, but unfortunately, it took off. And then I was forced by the Preston Cyberman to, I don't really like the beat ballads, me. <laughs> you know? But I did play a lot of them because Pete Lawson would say, come on, give me a fucking play it. You have to play it. I'll give it to you for 20 quid and you play it for us. So we started playing a lot of slower stuff and all that. I wanted to keep playing stuff like the Enchantments and whatever else was fast that we played. But I... Here you go. I think that us introducing the deeper stuff, I don't know, eventually it's... I see today people craving about, oh, listen to the vocals, they're magnificent. I'm like, yeah, but there's no arrangement. There's no stirring power behind the vocals. Yes, it's a soulful vocal, but it's not northern, is it? It's just soul. Does that make any sense to yeah, you? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, uh, actually. Uh, and, and, and the beat ballads are actually... the. I, I see a massive, like increasing people wanting to hear that sound at the moment. And I'm not sure if it's just because people are getting older now, but, and they can't dance this fast stuff. But I now, don't know. I know it's a kind of clever attitude to it. Like, look at me, I'm clever. I'm listening to the really soulful stuff. And I, I don't like that. And I think I'm to blame because I was that one night where I was trying to fucking impress Sam with how soulful my records could be. I thought, right, I'm not playing enchantments. I'm not playing that. I'm not going to play that. I'm going to play all the really soulful stuff. I'll play, uh, oh Christ, that thing on Tina, Roy Roberts, blah, 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 and stuff like that. I thought, I'll play these and Sam's bound to like them. Then, but he was just moaning because he hadn't been. He hadn't come to hear what we were playing. He assumed we were carrying on what Russ and Stanley had been doing. Well, that's what he assumed. And he hadn't been to hear us. And then, yes, yeah, Sam started playing 60s Newies again. You know, he got into the 60s Newies thing again from that. So, no, we, we converted Sam back to the cause type thing. And that. But, yeah, I always love Sam. Yeah, every interview I have, someone actually mentions Soul Sam, and I think he just, oh. he's such a legend. He really is. We'll have to get him on oh, for an interview one time. Um, but yeah, you actually mentioned that the press and cy Cybermen, they're the ones right. who complained about the beat ballads. No, um, they're the ones that wanted the beat ballads. Oh, they wanted the beat ballads. They wanted the beat ballads. Right, okay. Yeah, so stand and all that, yeah. Just for our viewers who may not know, could you just uh, explain who the press and Cybermen are and just describe what they were about and what was so fascinating about them? Fascinating, they were fucking annoying. <laughs> uh, they were like an old hardcore uh, Wigan record bar crowd, mainly from Preston and Ormskirk and places like that, that were totally into the 60s newish thing. You know, woof, maybe one of them liked modern, the rest were all 60s newish things. And then when I started playing, oh God, I've got to try and remember, Hearts Beating Stronger and things like that, that hang on, Blue Cat. Christ, I'm trying to remember records. Playing stuff like that, they'd all go on the floor and they'd do a sort of Cybermen waddle to it and ooh, ooh, ooh. And they looked like Cybermen the way they danced, except that. Uh, and they were sort of a gang of thuggy types that liked really the soulful stuff. So the Cybermen were pushing for the beat ballad thing. And I was trying to resist them. And, that, and Pete Lawson was the leader. Pete Lawson was a, um, a Preston Cyberman as well. I don't know if he was a cyberman, he was like their guru, their leader. You know, he would feed me records. So I was getting, I never actually did the John Anderson thing. You know, uh, big DJs before that signed up with John Anderson, like Sierra Lynn and Pat Brady and all that, and Anderson would supply records, but I never did it. I was getting records from Butch and from Pete Lawson and from various other folk and from the States. Like I said, then Pete would be supplying me stuff, but he'd, I loved Pete tremendously and he'd, um, forced me to buy these um, Freddie Houston thing. Uh, I'll never, I can't even mind, fuck it. Slower stuff. And he'd come on, play that. If you don't play that, I'm not going to sell you this. So he'd have something first that I wanted and 
he'd force me to play the slow thing so I could buy the fast thing off him and all that. But the Cybermen loved that stuff and all that. And the Cybermen expanded to Scottish punters became Cybermen and wanted the, the slow stuff. The, what was that fucking thing on Brute? Uh, I never liked it. I found the thing and I played it and it was my discovery, but I never really liked it uh, on Brute Green Label. Mm. When you lose the one you love uh, by somebody. They're paying <laughs> 5,000 quid for it now and all that. Oh, really? And you discovered yeah. it? I found that I was playing it and then I never really liked it. And as an excuse to get out of playing it, it was Gilly, do you know Gilly? It just yeah, yeah, book. good friends with Gilly. It was Gilly's birthday one night and I thought, right, I'll give him this for his birthday. You know, that'll break him down and I can stop playing the fucking thing. So I gave it to Gilly for his birthday. You know, so he'd be very happy and I could say, right, I don't need to play that bloody thing anymore. So as you can tell, I wasn't really into the slow records. Oh, that is um that's such a great gift <laughs> definitely oh, right. uh, I, yeah i didn't know you was friends with gilly either so that's that's um, oh nice christ uh, we used to when we first started going to stafford gary was still on gary rushbrook and me guy gary julie rushbrook and all that we'd all pick up a guy's place at margaret's drive through then pick up gilly from burton on trent and gilly and lynn and all that and there would be a convoy going through type thing so gilly was part of the gang so he was part of the Guy Hennigan, me, Garlic George gang. Garlic George was brilliant, fucking hell. He's yeah, Garlic George? Him. No, oh, I've never heard of Garlic George. Yeah. Oh, fucking tremendous. He was one of my record suppliers and guys, totally off the head, looked like the chef out of the Muppets, used to eat raw garlic to keep vampires away, stuff like that. Uh, he phoned me up one day when I was working in a butcher's factory. He phoned me up one day. He said, Keba, I'm just checking. You seem to be, you know, he trusted me in advice and all that. Um, now, I know the neighbours are possessed with demons. So I, I cut the brake cables this morning. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's a sin because uh, I can get rid of the demons, but I don't f feel that they deserve this. And um, I, oh, fucking hell, George. You know, the best way to handle demons is to psychiatrists are really good at understanding demons go and see a psychiatrist and all that he was genuinely that fucked uh, i went to his house um he had two houses one in nottingham full of records i know that i think he was a polish refugee from the war he was a kid when he came over and his parents were very very rich and he had two houses full of records top to bottom and he was into northern and all that so he took me to the nottingham house and downstairs goes through records and upstairs and I walks in upstairs and the curtains are drawing and uh, there's records all over the place so I goes up and opens the curtains no no they're watching they're always watching they're always watching and I look out quickly and it's just an empty field out the back and he shuts the curtains and for god's sakes never open the curtains they're always watching and he'd do stuff like if I was going to meet him at the Derby house he said don't come to the house um I'll pick you up at the station, but I'm going to drop you two streets away so nobody sees you come. Like, what the fuck's going on? He was convinced that um, demons were spying on him. That was Garlic George. But he supplied quite a lot of good Northern records. Sorry, I went off on a sideline then. No, no, I loved it. I really loved that story. Uh, is, is, and Garlic George, is he still is he, is he still around now? No, died. Died uh, just about three or four years ago. And all that. And Eddie Pierce got all his records because I was like, shit, let's get in there and get his records. It was Garlic George. He, have you heard of the Rare Groove scene? The Rare Groove scene, yeah. Uh, in the 80s, and there was a scene that sort of spoke up in London where they were playing American 60s funk records and a bit of soul and all that. And they were buying it mostly from a shop in Camden, a basement shop, or the Norman J folk like that started with this. Now, Garlic George used to come to my house at this time with a little handful of records for me and a couple of big... Uh, 100, 150 count boxes and he'd go off to Camden and sell them all, whatever, a pound each, etc. Then he'd come back to my house and all that. I was like, George, we'll go out for a drink tonight. Oh, uh, no, I've, I've actually got an appointment tonight. I, I can't possibly, um, no, I've got an appointment. I've got an appointment. So off he'd go, spend the money he'd got for the records on a prostitute because the poor bugger was never going to get a woman otherwise and then come back later that night, go to sleep and bugger off back to Derby and then back down again a month later and it was the same rigmarole. So Garlic George's desires for a prostitute were what uh, created the rare groove scene in London because he was offloading, he had 
fucking hundreds of thousands of acres. They were offering thousands and thousands of rare groove records into this Camden shop, and all these young lads were running in there. Oh, fucking hell, where did all this come from? Etc. Which was lovely. So that was it. Garlic George was a very important man on the scene. He supplied me, Guy, quite a few. But by fuck, if you saw him, he was a weird looking bugger. Um, <laughs> I think completely a lot of people mad. on the scene are, I think. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, he just sounds so interesting. I'd really love it to was. know more about him. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have to do a bit of digging about Garlic George because I've never, ever heard about him. And Do a bit of digging for Garlic George, yeah. I will, definitely. So um, yeah, so going back to DJing and dancing. All oh, right. You actually won the title for uh, the Disco Dancing Championships, am I right? Aye, that sort of thing, aye, yeah. Uh, that, was, uh, that was when I was living in Aberdeen, I know that, and where it was at the Beach Ballroom, I can't even mind the, the competition, and we went down there for a laugh. And all that, and then these folk were doing their John Travolta's, and all of them went, We said, For fuck's sake, Skeb, have you heard how much money you'll win? You can't get in there, get in there, get in there. And I thought, Oh, all right, then, didn't he take the piss out of me? And all that. So I entered and won, and then I entered the next final and won that, then down to London, and all that. But uh, yeah, I, I was horribly embarrassed. If you look at that thing, have you seen the thing on YouTube with me dancing? I fucking yeah, I hated certainly it. have. <laughs> uh, as I'm dancing, there's a guy shouting and waving this coloured stick at me, saying, smile, smile, use the whole floor. Smile, use the whole floor. I'm like, fuck off, you London twat. <laughs> you know, I don't dance like, who fucking put a plastic floor here, bastards? You know that. So I, I didn't enjoy it, but by fuck, I enjoyed the money I got. How much money did you get, if you don't mind me asking? 500 quid. In so that's a lot back then. 79, that's 5,000 now or something like that. Yeah, spunked it all on records uh, very quickly. Yeah, so that, that funded your record collection, did uh, it? Oh, it helped tremendously, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you moved from Stafford onto, um, to like, the London scenes, um, do, doing a lot of DJing down there, London. I was DJing when... in London before Stafford. I, I was living in London and I was DJing... So I did the Camden Palais, where it was Rusty Egan and Steve Strange who were into that new romantic when I first moved down. They recognised me from Wigan and all that. Oh, come and play some records, man. And that's how I was playing Northern and new disco stuff then, etc. But yeah, I love still then, so... Uh. Um, and you ran Madame Jojo's, didn't you? Oh, that was uh, later, right. That's... Yeah. Uh, well, fucking hell. I fucked off to Japan. I got a booking in Japan in 1989 to do one night staging. And I went out there. And I'd, some of the stuff Garlic George was taking to these rare groove boys, I'd nab off them because the labels were like, fuck me, that looks rare. Fuck me, you're not letting those cunts have this. That's a rare record. Let them have the shite on King and stuff like that. I'll have the obscure stuff. And then I'd found some stuff in the States. I'm like, fucking hell, I'll buy the obscure label stuff. So I'd got divorced in 87 and sold my Northern collection and that. Butch and Rob Marriott bought the best ones and then the rest went to John Manship, etc. And I was playing a bit of cheaper Northern and funk stuff at the time at a club called the Brain Club in London. This was from about 88, 89. Then the Japanese crowd wanted a DJ from the Brain Club to come out to Tokyo and do a night and all that, and it was good money. The rest of the Brain Club were going to Iceland to DJ, and I thought, oh, I'll do the Tokyo thing. I had a Japanese girlfriend at the time. So I goes out there, does my first night at a club called Golden Bayside. Huge fucking club, thousands of folk, and a queue of young men one side with notebooks looking at the records, and a queue of young ladies wanting me to teach them English and all that. I thought, fuck me, this is brilliant. So I stayed for six months till immigration kicked me out. And when I was in Japan, I started developing the, the deep funky sound. I started thinking, right, this stuff works. I'm going to fucking start playing this stuff. So I got a quite a probably a bigger following in Japan for the deep funk stuff I do than I have in Britain eventually. Gets back to Britain, thought, right, that's it. I can't afford Northern anymore. Butch will do that. He's fine. He's got the records. The Northern scene's in safe hands. I'll create this deep funk thing. So I started at the WAG Club on a Thursday night and it did well, but the guy was only paying me a few sweeties to DJ. So I thought I'll start my own night. And we started at the Leisure Lounge, Humpty Dump. Then we did Deep Funk at Ormond's, but the club was upping the rent and charging £5 for a can of warm Coke. And I thought, fuck that, we'll go somewhere else. And eventually I settled on uh, Madame Jojo's and that, and it just went boom. 
You know, it's, it was rammed, solid, for 18 years. Marvellous. And I was playing obscure funk and a lot of modern soul. So 30% of my deep funk night was modern and tiny bits of northern. And it did very, very well. And I had a lovely time. The funk, the funk side of um, soul music is actually just so big and popular on the all night scene now. Like, and, and that is obviously a direct result of, of your influence. And that must. I don't know be... if it's a result of my influence. No, I don't think so. Uh, I think they might have found the records because of my influence that the records came into Britain, but none of the scene were interested in what I was doing. You know, Butch came down and Butch did. Uh, I got him on as a partner DJ for a while. But it was like, ah, oh, fucking hell, no, they're not getting it like the I can't play a crowd that don't get into the records. All they're doing is dancing. I'm like, hey, what the fuck's wrong with that? You know, they're dancing, they're enjoying it. They don't have to be record hunters and want to buy records. Let them just enjoy it. So Butch did it a few times, then just came as a customer. But none of the scene came, you know. First, okay, Trickster came. Uh, none of the scene, yeah, I mean, none of the old scene came and had a sniff at what I was doing, which was irritating. No, that's a lie. Guy Hennigan came and he DJed there for three years with me. That's true. Oh, my memory's clicking in now. Yes, Guy loved it and he DJed and he started buying funk records and all. Said that. But uh, I don't think what I did with Deep Funk influenced the folk playing funk today on the scene. I think I just found loads of records and then those records are available for those folk to play on the scene today. I'd completely gone from the scene by the time they started playing it. Plus, I'm bored shitless with funk now. I did it for 20 years and four or five nights a week. I was flying all over the fucking world playing funk and I just got sick of it. There you go. So <laughs> I like me Northern now. I like me Rockabilly and I like me 60s Garage. But the funk, I can't handle it now. I've mm. overdone it. Uh, well, that is, well <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's, it's old news for you, but it's, it's just like so big on the, the night of scene now. After you've, like, well, it was exciting and it was exciting and fresh for me when I was finding the stuff. It was like, whoa, fucking hell, yeah. This is, whoa, fucking hell, never heard that before and all that. And yeah. But now, you know, I've heard it all and it's not exciting anymore. So that's why. So people will say, why the fuck does Kev Dodge keep changing scenes? You know, he's got, not got no loyalty. And I'm like, yeah, but. Now, if there was five, six brand new fucking killer Northern records turning up every week, I'd probably still be a Northern DJ. But you're lucky to get fucking five a year, you know, good ones. You're probably lucky to get one a year now, really good ones turning up and all that. So it's not exciting. And then I did the Rocky Billy, I did the funk thing. And it was when it got to the stage of we're running out of new discoveries now. We got bands making new funk, which helped, Sharon Jones and all that. But then that bugger died. And, you know, it, was, uh, it wasn't exciting. I wasn't getting new stuff. Then I got into playing Rocky Billy and that. And then there wasn't enough new stuff. Now I'm into playing 60s Garage and there's still plenty new stuff for me to play that excites me you know the garage collectors the serious ones probably know all the stuff that i'm getting excited about but i don't and i'm a very selfish dj i play what excites me if that makes sense no and i think i think that's quite influential and progressive of a dj like you know it was, i don't know i think you should dj what you're passionate about and then hopefully the, the people will follow and be passionate also about that, type right. of that sound so um yeah no that's that, that sounds right to me uh, uh, well, that's me. That's what I do. Uh, I play what excites me. To wrap it up, because we're uh, just going to get it to an hour, um, I'm going to do a bit of a fire round. But first of all, I just wanted to talk about what you're doing now. Like, well, I'm uh, sitting in my bed talking to you, scratching <laughs> myself and sucking on my electronic pipe thing. <laughs> no, I meant, um, I meant um, yeah, bef before lockdown, uh, pre-lockdown, what, what events were you going to? What were we DJing? All right, I was doing uh, a place called the Paper Dress Vintage, the Moth Club. Uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff abroad. I just got back from Japan and all that. I do Japan once a year, at least twice a year if I can and all that. And as soon as lockdown's finished, that's where I'm going because that's where I get the best response and the best clubs and all that and the best money, etc. So just playing around all over the place, Spain, Germany, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I've been, the deep funk thing put me on the sort of world stage where trendy DJs like Jazzy Jeff and folk like that I used to get bookings with and stuff. So it did me the world of good. So I was getting bookings, yeah, before February or March or whenever it was, I was still getting the bookings to do stuff abroad, which was a fucker because I had a festival lined up in France, which was paying me a fucking fortune. And it 
cancelled because you know, of lockdown about a few weeks to go. I was like, oh, fuck off. I can't mind what was good. So I'm like three grand for a two hour set. I'm like, fucking oh. hell. Oh, I, so. that, just, that sounds such a shame. It's, yes. It's, it's put. It's put everything uh, in pause, hasn't it? But hopefully, hopefully we'll be back. Oh, okay, I'll be back soon. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. I know that. I've been sneaking records in. I know that. So as luck would have it, the Japanese are lovely people. There's a guy that books me all the tours I do in Japan. There's this multi-millionaire who runs, he's got about 40 fashion shops around Japan and all that. And he didn't need it, but he wanted says, Kev, could you do some music for my stores? Like, you know. And eventually I wound up doing like 16 hours of music for his shops, which he didn't need because he's got the fucking records himself. He could have done it himself. But he paid me a fortune to do that. So that's seen me through lockdown quite well. And I bought records with. So good on you, Mori chan yeah. Well, the, the the Japan Japan like it's got a massive soul scene now, and it's it's crazy to think that right. this this little old northern soul scene back in the seventies is actually worldwide now. Um, well, yes, there's a reason for that, of course. The Japanese scene in Kobe. So all four of the guys that run it there's Shuhei, Yue, Ryo Kitaki, Seiji, and fuck me if I better not forget the fourth one. I've forgotten his name. He won't be watching this, but I've forgotten his name. Anyway, they all stayed at my house in the early 90s when I was doing Deep Funk and all that, and I took them to the 100 Club and took them to All Nighters, and they all got fucking hooked on it, and then they went back and were infused to get something like that in Japan, and now they've got something better than that. Kobe's fucking one of the best All Nighters you'll ever go to, and that is Kobe in Japan. It's just outside Osaka, and that's where the, all four of them are from, and they've got this wonderful scene going. Marvellous. Yeah, I've seen I've seen videos of it, and it it just looks incredible. It looks like everything I, I'd I'd hope the soul scene would be, and just really uh, atmospheric and atmospheric, exciting, yeah, fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it it just looks great. Um, yeah, no right. old funny duddies like me. <laughs> I don't people. mind the old, uh, you know, the old folk. I you know I find uh, them the most interesting people because uh, my generation are boring as anything. But um, all right then. Yeah. So um, yes, I um, agree. Yeah, they've not got much going for them, I don't think, right. our generation. I'm just lucky I've fall, fallen into Northern Soul and soul music and uh, get to meet with wonderful, weird people like yourself. Um, right. So, fire round, let's go. Right. Uh, the first record you ever bought? Uh, I bought four at that Dundee thing. Uh, one of it was the I Kids Two Time and Double Dealing. Christ, I can't remember. Oh, um, the not every beat of my heart. The Jew... Mind yellow label. Ah, right, so I bought four records at the Dundee. The first record I ever bought as a Northern record, I bought Beatles and shit like that when I was a kid, but as a Northern record was I Catch Two Time and Double D. And okay, the first uh, record I ever asked for and chased after to buy. So when I bought them four, I actually went up to the record bar. And there was a guy from Dundee or Edinburgh. I says, Look, uh, pick out four goodies for us, will you? Oh, they were £2 each or something. Uh, so that's he picked them out. But the first record that I made a beeline to buy was uh, The Human Beings, Nobody But Me. Okay, the record that you hate the most? Uh, what do you call it? George Lemon's Fascinating Girl. Turns my fucking stomach. <laughs> Turn my stomach then, turns my stomach now. Oh, that's great to know. Um, sorry, the first ever track you played on a DJ spot? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. A record that holds an important memory? Uh, a record that holds a special memory? No, the record I remember the most effect when I first did it was Burning Bush Keeps On Burning. When that first got played, that was... Wow, I was excited. I shot me load in my pants there when it got played. <laughs> and I still love it today. And then your favourite ever Northern Soul event that you've been to and attended? Wigan. Wigan, without a doubt. Without a doubt, yeah, Wigan. Yeah, no two ways about it. Just because of the atmosphere and the excitement. Uh, you know. Well, thank you, Kev. It's been an absolute honour um, to speak with you. Is there anything you'd like to add to the end of this interview and mention to everyone? Because uh, this interview will go worldwide. We've got viewers all over. So um, anything you'd like to mention? Uh, not really. Don't be narrow-minded. That's all. Don't no. cling to a soul scene like a religion. No, they say, that's... the soul scene, it's a way of life. No, it's a fucking great load of music, but there's loads of other scenes with great music. Well, there's not. There's a couple of others. The rockabilly in the garage scene is great and all that. So, uh, 
that's, yeah, no, that's great advice so thank you Ked for joining us today um, thank you yeah and hopefully we'll speak again soon um, thank you for everyone for tuning in just sub subscribe below um, if you'd like to see more okay thank you bye 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 <laughs>